Good afternoon and a warm welcome to the 2021 Taxation Awards. My name is Jonathan Scriven and I'm the Director of Tax Markets at LexisNexis. When I introduced last year's virtual awards, it never occurred to me that 12 months on we would be forced to run it virtually again. As the pandemic seemed to be loosening its grip last autumn, we did briefly hope that we could hold, hold our usual event at the Hilton this year, but it soon became clear that this was not going to be possible. This created a dilemma. We were determined to keep the awards going, but we also realised that it would be too much of an imposition on firms struggling with the challenges of lockdown to ask them to take the time to submit entries in all of the usual categories. So for 2021, we have opted for a slimmed down version of the awards, which will enable us to honour three fantastic individuals at various stages of their careers. Before we reveal the names, I did want to say a few words about what we at Tolly have been doing over the last 12 months. We appreciated early on that home working would present many logistical challenges to our customers. Now we couldn't, I'm afraid, help with homeschooling, but we did want to make sure that nobody was inconvenienced by not having access to the technical resources which they would normally have in their office. So we rolled out a number of enhancements to our Tolly Tax Intelligence portfolio. We've made it easier for our users to find answers faster with an enhanced search and browse experience, as well as increasing our tax content coverage. We have also harnessed new technologies and delivered new tools to help increase productivity, like our new tax case analytics tool and our new HMRC manual comparator tool. We've also upgraded and streamlined our current awareness and news to ensure you are kept abreast of all changes, as well as upgrading our online learning offerings to ensure you can continue to drive talent development across your organisation. The feedback on the enhancements to the Tolly Tax Intelligence portfolio has been really positive and has enabled our users to continue to deliver an outstanding service to their clients during the pandemic and the move to home working. Finally, I want to mention something which would have been dear to the heart of our much missed friend and colleague Chris Jones. Chris was passionate about Tolly and always challenged the team here to make the phrase to Tolly the tax equivalent of to Google. We have now managed to make this a reality with the launch of our new search engine plugin, Tolly This, which does exactly what he had hoped for. Click on it and the relevant Tolly content will pop straight onto your screen. It's available free to all of our users. If you haven't tried it yet, please do go to the link which appears on the bottom of your screen now and give it a go. Now, an event like this cannot function without the help of so many people. And I'd like to thank everybody involved for their hard work in putting this afternoon's event together. I'd also like to thank Tax Systems for their sponsorship of this presentation. Here to say a few words is Andy Mills, the Sales Director at Tax Systems. Hi, I'm Andy Mills, Sales Director at Tax Systems where we have been at the forefront of developing and providing tax compliance technology for 30 years. Here at Tax Systems, we believe that tax digitalization will not only revolutionize how taxpayers pay tax, but how the authority leverages powerful data to collect and audit tax returns. Furthermore, improvements to the amount and quality of data available to the authorities will not only be used to better identify non-compliant taxpayers for targeted audits, but also ensure that compliant, responsible taxpayers are less frequently subjected to the cost and inconvenience of an audit. Additionally, the pace in which taxes are being digitalised is increasing. We've all experienced this with MTD for VAT. Next, it will be income tax and corporation tax, which means that being ahead of the curve is becoming even more important. Our vision at Tax Systems is to create a platform for the digitalization of tax that is faster, better, and smarter than anything else on the market. While we're best known for Alpha Tax, our corporation tax software, which has been a market leader for 30 years, we've also developed leading edge technology called Alpha 360. This is a compliance product that is a platform for managing the digitalization of taxes both now and into the future. 
Technology like this will help transform tax functions, but it is talented individuals and great teams that make it happen. So we're both delighted and excited to be sponsoring an event that acknowledges and celebrates the contribution that key individuals have made to the profession over the past year. Best of luck to all those shortlisted. Goodbye now. Now it's time to get down to business. Our first award is for Taxation's Rising Star. This is always a great barometer of the future of the profession. And if this year's high quality crop of entries is anything to go by, we can be confident that our future is in great hands. From a long list of nominees, the following individuals were shortlisted. As ever, it was really difficult to pick out one individual from such a strong list of nominations. Our winner tonight is somebody who has already made significant contributions to the tax community as an advisor, writer and lecturer, with a special interest in the role of taxation in broader family life. Taxation's rising star in 2021 is Sophia Thomas. Please join me in congratulating Sophia. We will be sending the trophy to Sophia and to all the other winners tonight in the post. Please do share with us your photos of you with your trophies when you get them in. I'm now delighted to introduce our guest speaker for this evening. It is a cliche to say that somebody needs no introduction, but that is certainly the case in this instance. So please welcome President of the Chartered Institute of Taxation and multi-award winner at previous Taxation Awards, Peter Rainey. Thank you, John. It's great to be able to take part in this year's reduced award ceremony. I can't wait for the return of the full face-to-face -face extravaganza next year. I've been asked to reflect a little on the state of the tax profession as we begin to emerge from the shadow of the pandemic. Firstly, we can't think about where we are now without thinking about what we've come through in the last 14 months, a huge national and global tragedy. We may have grown used to it by now, but when we first went into lockdown, many of us were pretty scared. Scared for our health, yes, but also scared professionally. Many firms put lots of staff into furlough. Those same firms in the end had pretty good years and have been able to pay the furlough money back to HMRC. But we didn't know that at the time. It was also a time of huge pressure. Some smaller firms did no work at all between March and June, and despite the various easements, there were still plenty of deadlines to meet, including those for the huge new schemes we all had to get our heads around. Adding ill health, homeschooling, and other domestic challenges, and you can see why 2020 was such a stressful year for so many. But we adapted, we zoomed, we teamed, we worked from spare bedrooms and kitchen tables and we supported our clients. In 2020, HMRC really rose to the occasion, putting in place that huge and speedy, unprecedented schemes to support jobs and income. They would not have been the success they had been without the work of our profession, publicizing them, making sure people understood the rapidly changing rules, picking up furlough calculations, putting in, in many cases, long hours of work not charged for, as Jesse Norman told us in April this year, your involvement has been crucial. And if I may put in a word for the work of the CIOT and other professional bodies, not just explaining what was going on, but also working with HMRC on the development and implementation of these schemes, helping shape guidance, as well as identifying a range of practical easements and pragmatic deferrals to keep our tax system running relatively smoothly through the year. The profession and HMRC have never worked so closely together as we have in the past 14 months. So let's look forward. Talking to people across the profession, I found that with just a few exceptions, most partners and experienced staff like working from home and they certainly don't miss the commute. They found that they can work from home seamlessly and effectively. They've also seen how efficient virtual meetings can be, leaving one minute and being at another 
within a couple of minutes. The question on many lips is, why retain expensive offices in a city? On the other hand, most younger tax professionals and trainees really can't wait to get back to the office. Many of them lack suitable conditions for home working, and I think we'd all agree that the office is the best place for on-the-job training and mentoring. That's, after all, how we all learned our trade. Putting this together, it seems to me we're heading towards a hybrid model where half the week we spent in the office and the other half working from home. Transactional meetings will continue to take place online, while face-to-face -face meetings will be saved mostly for situations where you're trying to build a relationship. Then there's digitalization. The pandemic didn't start this process, but it's definitely accelerated it. HMRC and ministers have been inspired to be even more ambitious about creating a fully digital tax system. The 10-year strategy paper highlights their plans. More use of third-party data, more effective pre-population of data, and more timely uploading of data under MTD. Now, there are plenty of risks and challenges here. Data security and data accuracy, to name just two. The scandal of the post office's horizon system shows what can happen if you trust too blindly infallible technology. But the HMRC are right to be pursuing these goals, and the tax profession are right to be engaging with them, to shape digital processes and ensure the necessary safeguards are built into them. Of course, we also need to look at our own systems. The pandemic has already been a great catalyst for the take up of cloud based software right across the profession. I also think artificial intelligence or AI will play a growing role. Tax technology can increasingly get you to a situation where if you have a certain set of facts and someone who's in a certain situation may be selling their business, then an AI flowchart can tell you what reliefs they should qualify for. It's still still at a rudimentary stage, but it is happening. So are we going to be replaced by bots? Probably not. We survived the calculator. We survived the spreadsheet. And I think we can survive the AI revolution too. But it will change our work. It will facilitate improved productivity and innovation. It will free up time for us to add more value to the work of our clients. And it will make even clearer that the firm's best place to prosper in future will be those who take their offering beyond simply crunching numbers to become their clients' trusted advisors. Then there's regulation. In spring last year, the government consulted on ways to raise standards in the tax advice market. The first fruit of that consultation is a proposal that everyone offering tax advice, whether a member of a professional body or not, should be required to hold professional indemnity insurance. That's a sensible proposal, but it may not on its own be sufficient. In the end, I suspect the choice will come down to either effective self-regulation or external regulation being imposed on us. Of course, I favour the former, backed up by strong consumer protection laws. I really am a firm believer that the way to ensure this regulation is proportionate and well-founded is through ongoing constructive engagement with government. The aim must be to stamp out the activities for those who push contrived tax schemes while not making life harder for the compliant majority of tax advisors who play a vital role in the proper administration of the tax system. So this is how I see the future of the profession. Hybrid working, digitalization, advice backed up with AI, and effective self-regulation. But what kind of tax system will be advising on? Digitalization aside, the government has two main focuses right now, supporting recovery and what the Treasury calls strengthening the public finances. Supporting recovery means that the government is looking for measures to stimulate growth and incentivize businesses to invest now, like the super deduction introduced in the budget, and also to help them with cash flow, like the extended carryback of trading losses, something which I have been arguing for. On strengthening the public finances, we saw a number of allowances and thresholds frozen in the budget. But the real big ticket item, of course, is the increase in corporation tax. Now, 
it's easy to see why this is politically attractive. Companies have no votes after all. But as we all know, the burden of corporation tax does not really fall on companies. Ultimately, it's suffered by some combination of the business's customers, its shareholders, and its workers. But the money has to come from somewhere. And in the wider scheme of things, a rate of 25% is still reasonably competitive on an international basis, especially as the US and others look also to raise their rates. It does seem the so-called race to the bottom is over, especially with the prospect of a global minimum tax rate hovering into view. There's plenty of purely domestic areas too where pressure for tax reform is building. The Treasury Committee identified some of them in their report on tax after coronavirus, which I was delighted to chair the launch of shortly before the budget day. This report covers pretty much the whole spectrum of taxes, but four areas were identified for particular need of reform. Property taxes and FDLT in particular, capital taxes, pension tax relief, and most of all, the differences in how we tax different forms of work. I strongly suspect that sooner or later, a government will come along and make radical changes in all these areas. The challenge in doing so now is that government lacks the money to sugar the pills for those who will lose out. But we need to watch this space. Another priority identified by the committee is the role of taxes in greening the economy. I invited the eminent economist, Sir Dieter Helm, to give this year's CTA address on this topic last week, which went down the storm. His view is that a single uniform carbon tax spread across the economy with appropriate border adjustments is the best way forward. Green taxes currently raise about 4.5% of the tax yield. And I'm sure this will rise substantially over the decade ahead, and rightly so, as tax plays its part in getting us towards net zero. So in conclusion, a time for change, both for the profession and for the tax system as a whole. Plenty of opportunities for the dynamic, the inventive and the quick to adapt. And plenty for those of us interested in tax policy developments to chew on. And talking of dynamic tax professionals, I'd like now to present our second award. This is for the person who has made an outstanding contribution to taxation in 2020-21. This award is determined by popular vote from all in the profession, and I'm delighted to say that very large numbers of you voted in our online poll. As a reminder, the nominees were Richard Asquith, Rebecca Bennyworth, Mark Groom, Rebecca Seeley Harris and John Kinsella. I'm delighted to announce that the winner is Mark Groom. Mark, please accept my hearty congratulations and a virtual handshake. Let's hope it's not too long before we can shake hands in person. I'd now like to hand over to Andrew Hubbard Editor-in-Chief of Taxation Magazine, to present our final award. Thank you, Peter. It seems a very long time ago that we first met in that hotel off the A46, as youngish tax advisors presenting at a workshop on the Finance Act 1989 value shifting rules. I'm not sure I fully understand them even now. Long careers being wisdom and experience, and nobody exemplifies that more than the winner of our Lifetime Achievement Award. Not that this afternoon's nominee has stepped back in any way. Indeed, I was with him on an online event only a few weeks ago. When all of the new roles that he had taken on recently were announced, I thought that perhaps I should be nominating him for the Most Promising Newcomer Award. But he has achieved so much in his career both as a long-standing partner in an important regional firm and through his long association with the ICAEW and CIOT. So lifetime achievement is indeed the right category for him. I've known him for many years and have always admired the way that he has used his influence and reputation not to further his own career, but to improve the tax system for all. He has always had a great interest in the role of technology in the tax system, but has never been a zealot always taking a pragmatic and thoughtful approach. 
He's trusted by practitioners in firms large and small to represent their views fairly, but he's also highly respected by HMRC and government. Not an easy balancing act. He has always taken the view that good relationships with HMRC are critical to our profession. That means, and I have seen this many times, that he could be trenchant in his criticism when things don't go well, but also that people at the highest level of government and the civil service take note of what he says. On top of this, he's one of the most modest and caring people I've met in my many long years in our profession. I greatly value his counsel and friendship. So the winner of our Lifetime Achievement Award is, as you will have certainly worked out by now, Paul Aplin. Andrew, thank you. You very generously summed up the things I've tried to achieve over the years. I do believe our relationship with HMRC is critical. We're always going to disagree over particular cases. I'd worry if we didn't. But we have a shared interest in trying to improve tax administration and to make it simpler and more effective for the ordinary taxpayer. I've always believed that we were equal partners in that endeavour. And I've always seen technology not as some kind of magic wand, but as a tool and a key tool for helping us to improve tax administration. To date, I think we've only just scratched the surface in terms of technology's potential to help us do that. I've been lucky over the years to work with and to learn from some incredibly talented, supportive and tolerant people. The most tolerant and the person without whom I couldn't have achieved any of it being my wife, who always keeps me firmly grounded in reality. Back in 2007, when I received the Tax Personality of the Year Award, her verdict, hmm, tax and personality, two words you don't often hear in the same sentence. Now, Sharon might worry that this Lifetime Achievement Award is going to be taken by me as a sign that I should retire completely, but she knows I wouldn't know how to do that. Someone many years ago told me I was a restless spirit. Well, I intend to be a restless spirit in tax for a good many years yet. And this Lifetime Achievement Award is just the encouragement I need to carry on doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And can I add my congratulations as well? That brings us to the end of this afternoon's event. Congratulations to our three winners and to all those who made the shortlist. Thanks again to Peter, to the team at LexisNexis for putting the event together so professionally and to our sponsors, Tax Systems. Next year, fingers crossed, we will be together at a live ceremony when we, we will be able to present awards across the full range of categories. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this afternoon's event and next time you have a tax question, remember to tolly it.